Welcome to Water from the Well, a work of the Church of Christ in Santa Clara. I'm here with Mike Wilson, and we're talking about his book, Inspiration to Ink, the big picture of how we got the Bible. Morning, Mike. Good morning. What prompted you to write Inspiration to Ink? Well, most books on how we got the Bible are just too technical, full of insider terms that are a turnoff for the average person. In other words, they make what should be a thrilling subject tedious and boring. This book, on the other hand, gives the non-specialist believer a solid foundational understanding of how the Bible came down to us, and I've done it in in non-technical language. Uh, We put lots of photos in there, full-color photos of ancient documents, relics, ancient Bibles, to try to make it an adventure in learning. And my aim in all this is to give believers a step-by-step framework to defend the integrity of the process down through the ages, from divine revelation to the publication and preservation of the sacred text, to the transmission of the manuscripts down through the ages, to the ultimate translation from the original Hebrew and Greek into English. I believe Christians need a concise and understandable framework to defend their faith in God's Word. This book meets that need in a way that I hope will be compelling and interesting. So what is the number one goal you hope the book will accomplish? That's a good question. If I had my number one hope fulfilled, I would want everybody who finishes reading this volume to get down on his or her knees and to glorify God. Amen. Glorify God for producing the most important, the most significant book ever published. I believe the, the Bible is truly the book of books, and everything about it, when properly understood, is absolutely magnificent. And so my hope is that everyone who reads Inspiration to Ink will be blown away by the massive investments of meticulous care and sacrifices that have been made uh, down through the ages that uh, have made the Bible possible. Uh, There was a lot of bloodshed involved, a lot of lives that were sacrificed, and we should never take this for granted. We should have a greater appreciation of of the price that was paid for us to even be able to have the privilege of owning and reading our own copies of the Word of God. You know, there are a lot of people that have their own copy of the Bible, and uh, you know, a lot of people look at it in different ways, and a lot of times it's based on the, uh, the denomination that they might belong to and the way they practice. Um, in what ways do you believe that this book might get people to look at the Bible differently? Well, I think that there are a lot of people that, that look at the Bible as simply a springboard to fulfill their own uh, agenda or their own desires of, of what they think they should get out of their faith. Uh, they don't look at it as a book of absolute authority or a, a book that, that ultimately has dual authorship, both from God and human messengers that were divinely appointed. And so, in my view... No portion of the Bible is the result of a natural evolutionary process that developed over a long period of time with human beings driving the process, uh, as if almost by accident. Uh, On the other hand, I believe the Bible came down to us with eternal purpose, with the highest integrity, because God drove everything. God is the ultimate originator and the guarantor every step of the way. And so when we view everything in retrospect, 2020 hindsight, we see in the words of the Apostle Paul the power of God and the wisdom of God. What I think people don't realize, including many Christians, is that many of the nuts and bolts of the publication and distribution processes are embedded in the Bible itself. There are instructions given on how to differentiate a legitimate message of God from the counterfeit. And once that message is revealed and recorded, there were to be no additions, no subtractions, no alterations, no tampering. And those uh, warnings are in the sacred text and were definitely on the mind of scribes who did the hand copying of manuscripts. 
they knew that that there were curses about adding or taking away. So I also want people to understand or to be introduced to to men like John Wycliffe and William Tyndale. Tyndale in particular was the first to translate the Bible into English from the original Greek New Testament or the original Hebrew portions of it in the Old Testament. Absolutely brilliant man, brilliant translator, and we still use many of his words and phrases that have become embedded into the English language. And, and his dream was to put the Bible into the English language so that, that English-speaking people would have access to it. And he paid for that with his life. And, and if we understand those kind of sacrifices, I think we'll have a greater you know, appreciation of, of, of all of this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the charges by skeptics is that the transmission of the Bible was hopelessly garbled over the centuries. So it, it reminds me of that old uh, experiment where you take a message and you give it to one person, then they tell the next person, they tell the next person, they tell the next person. And by the time you get the message back, it's completely different. Um, and so how would you answer this charge? Well, it's common, but it's a totally false narrative, and I'll tell you why. We can essentially reconstruct the biblical text from thousands of Hebrew Old Testament manuscripts, thousands of Greek New Testament manuscripts, citations of virtually the entire New Testament quoted by the early church fathers in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. We've got the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have early translations of the Bible into other languages, and that would include the Greek Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. It would include the Latin Vulgate translated by Jerome in the late 4th century. It would include translations into other ancient languages such as Syriac, Coptic, Gothic, etc. Moreover, the, the average size of a Greek New Testament manuscript is 450 pages long. People don't know that. And there are over 5,800 of them, dating from the 2nd century all the way down to the 15th century and the emergence of Gutenberg's printing press. So when you do the math, 450 pages long, almost 6,000 of them, that's that's more than 2.5 million pages of text. And so when you add to the nearly 6,000 Greek New Testament manuscripts, uh, about 17,000 ancient Hebrew scrolls of the Old Testament, And then you have over 10,000 early versions in translated languages. Then you end up with over 30,000 manuscripts scattered over the centuries and on three different continents. That includes over 200 biblical manuscripts discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls from roughly the time of Jesus or before. It includes about 100 Greek New Testament manuscripts that were written from shortly after the time the New Testament was completed uh, over the next three centuries, the second, third, and fourth centuries, in other words, very early. And one or two of those manuscripts might even date from the first century. So to say that the Bible is by far and away the best attested work in all of antiquity is an understatement. Most ancient works of literature are lost. There are, are many that have been salvaged, but there might be four or five or ten manuscripts dated hundreds of years after the fact. The, the next best attested ancient work besides the Bible is Homer's Iliad, and there are less than 2,000 of those. Um, a very few of those manuscripts, which date to about 500 years after the work was written, and most of which were copied a 1,000 years after that. So you compare that to the New Testament, where you have almost 6,000 Greek New Testament manuscripts, and about 100 of them are within 300 years or so from when the New Testament was completed. And again, to put all this in perspective, among the Dead Sea Scrolls is the oldest Hebrew manuscript of an entire biblical book, the book of Isaiah which was about a 1,000 years older than any Hebrew manuscript of Isaiah ever discovered up to that point in time in 1947. And guess what? It's the same book, Mm -hmm. the same book of Isaiah. So scribes were fanatically meticulous in copying the Word of God word for word down through the ages 
occasional mistakes crept in, and those are less than 1% of the text, and usually they're, they're minor issues such as spelling variations and so on. But no essential teaching is compromised. And when you compare all those manuscripts that come from vastly different locations, you can recreate the original text with essential 100% certainty. Yeah, that's compelling information. <laughs> well, another charge is that the original documents have been lost. And all we have is copies of copies, so that there's no way that we can accurately reconstruct what the original manuscripts would have said. That's a common charge, too, that all we've got is copies of copies of copies. And, and we don't have the originals. That's, that's true. But I would argue that the integrity of the text is not based on a single relic of paper and ink. With hundreds, if not thousands, of manuscript copies of biblical books in existence, and many of which were, were there even before the development of the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. There was no centralized church hierarchy or bureaucracy, and so no one was in a position to make wholesale changes to the text once it came into being. The cat was already out of the bag. And so there's this popular myth that, that, that somehow the ecclesiastical powers invented this or manipulated it somehow so that, that what we've got now is, is fundamentally different than, than what was originally given. But in fact, the decentralization of the sacred text and manuscripts spread throughout the whole Christian world actually is not a minus, it's a plus. It makes the case even stronger. And so when you're going back to Homer, uh, no manuscript, uh, no original manuscript exists, but that doesn't make the Iliad any less authentic. We've got, again, copies of copies of copies, and no, no one denies the, the basic text of, uh, of the Iliad, but there are no original manuscripts. And um, going into to more modern times, not so much as a couplet written in Shakespeare's own hand has been proven to exist, and he died in 1616, which was just over 400 years ago. And although there are occasional questions about, you know, who Shakespeare was or who really authored these things, no one would deny that a genius put together those wonderful works, and no one would deny their power. Uh, no one would say Hamlet should not be performed in theatrical productions just because we don't have the original handwritten manuscript. Uh, I'll give you another illustration. If um, Aunt Martha had this wonderful cookie recipe in, in her head, and maybe she scribbled it out on, a, on an index card in uh, hard-to-read language, and, and, and a niece wanted to, to make that available to her sisters and uh, all of their children, and so a bunch of copies are made. So all of a sudden, Aunt Martha dies, and the original index card is even lost. That doesn't mean that Aunt Martha's cookie recipe no longer exists. Right. <laughs> You've got all these copies that uh, are probably written in, in, in uh, more easy-to-read to uh, lettering than her original index card. And I would argue that the case for the legitimacy of the biblical text is infinitely stronger than that. I would agree with you. Well, uh, Mike, I want to thank you for uh, talking to me for a little bit about your book. Looking forward to reading it and looking forward to just the, uh, the different angles that the book guides us in looking at the Bible, which is uh, the most important book ever written. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for listening. For more about us, check us out at truthseekers.org. There you'll find our links to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube.